This week's episode on Cup of Joe, the president and CEO of Mershman Fertilizer, Henry Mershman, joins us to talk about the fertilizer industry. And we have exciting news about Enlist E3, so stay tuned. Hi, this is Joe Mershman from Mershman Seeds, and we're here today, episode number 11, Cup of Joe. And uh, today we have Turk Riganator and Ben Peeper, and we have a special guest, uh, my brother Henry Mershman from the fertilizer division. And he currently serves as president of that company. And um, last, this past week, I was in Parole, Iowa with uh, Kathy and Bill Brewer. We had a meeting there, and one of the farmers asked me, so well, what's going on in the nitrogen business? So, Henry, uh, as president of Mershman Fertilizer, tell us a little bit about Mershman Fertilizer, where they're located, and what's going on in the nitrogen business today. Well, Mershman Fertilizer has four locations, uh, Fulton, Illinois, Burlington, Iowa, Fort Madison, Iowa, and Montrose, Iowa, and we've got a lot of uh, liquid and dry storage. Uh, one of the biggest reasons why we have a lot of storage is, you know, we we access most of our product uh, from river barges, and we're like a, a squirrel. We got to gather nuts to make it through the winter. Well, when the river shuts down, we got to make sure we have enough product to get through until open nav, which is typically the first 10 days in March. So I know Joe was asking me a little bit about fertilizer because he's got a lot of guys asking him what's going on. And I'm going to start out with a story about uh, a colleague of mine I've known for a long time. And he had to uh, speak at an engagement. And he had they introduced him with uh, 40 years in the nitrogen business. And he's an expert. And so he got up there. And the first thing he said, he says, well, I want to correct that. Um, he goes, uh, I have one year in the nitrogen business 40 times. And there's a lot of truth to that because every year is different. There's no such thing as a year that's exactly the same as a previous year. So I know we, we were talk, we're going to talk about nitrogen, but I'm going to touch on the phosphate and potash a little bit also and put my focus on the nitrogen. You know, phosphate prices from, you know, a year to 18 months ago have moved up uh, quite a bit and they've they seem like they've pretty much stabilized and one of the biggest things that affected that or made that happen was uh, Mosaic who's one of the largest phosphate producers in the world they have several large plants down in Florida and their highest cost plant uh, plant plant city they decided to shut down and so they closed it down and it was a million tons of phosphate a year and talking to upper management down there uh, when they made that decision they said yeah we were making 20 bucks a ton on on a million tons and we shut it down and the prices went up across the board and they've they got 160 more dollars 160 million more dollars of profit uh, by doing that and so what we're seeing is and we're seeing it in every faucet nitrogen phosphate and potash there's less and less players and they seem to be wanting to control the supply of the product to keep prices at an optimum for them um, so phosphate right now it seems like it's it's fairly stable they really don't see it moving up a lot don't see it really moving down a lot um, so I think we'll just kind of go through spring that way um, the potash potash has consistently been moving up and another uh, price increase is coming in uh, next week um, again what's happened there Two of the larger potash companies, Nutrien and PCS, have now merged, or excuse me, Agrium and, and, and PCS have now merged, and it's called Nutrien. And the thing about, the major thing about that is they also own the old CPS stores, which are retail stores, and they have 1,200 retail stores. So now when they're producing a lot of product and nobody's buying in the market, what we're seeing now is they've got an out they got an outlet to get rid of product through 1200 retail stores they can just start filling them so again they're controlling the supply of the inventory mm -hmm. and by doing it they can control the price a little bit and i know nobody likes to see that but this is when our government allows all these mergers and acquisitions and they keep getting bigger and bigger um, so to concentrate on nitrogen now I'll talk about the three components we got the ammonia first this fall we had probably one of the wettest falls that uh, I can ever remember and it's estimated out there that only 30 percent of the ammonia got applied in in the Midwest 
uh, in the intended acres. And it's a 2 million ton market, so there's 1.4 million ton of ammonia that still has to be applied. The, a lot of people think that a half a million tons of that ammonia will not get applied. They just physically will not have enough time. Um, you got to remember we've got a lot of the same storage we had that was 30, 40, 50 years ago. Same pipelines. Trucks are still hauling 20, 21 ton loads. Nothing's changed there. But on the farm level, you've got much bigger uh, custom application going on. You have bigger tractors. They're faster. We just cannot keep up and doing it. And like <laughs> talking to another colleague one day at a meeting, and and they were a nitrogen company, and they said, well, we finally figured it out. Henry and I said, what's that? We got to quit selling eight weeks of, of nitrogen in a six-week season. <laughs> <laughs> and there's a lot of truth to that. I always say ammonia is much like like an airplane. You know, if there, there's a 300 seats on that airplane, you know, they once they get get 250 seats of that sold or maybe 225 and then the price just keeps going up and up because they know once it fills they cannot keep selling because they can only deliver during a certain time frame um, so that's going to be a big thing because if 500,000 tons do not get applied they're going to have to use alternative forms of nitrogen which would be urea and UAN I think there's an adequate supply of product out there but whether it'll all be in the right places at the right time is probably going to be the problem. Um, moving on to urea. The, the urea market is much like, you know, even though the U.S. has built some new nitrogen plants, we still are a major importer of nitrogen. And so what happens in, in the urea market, everybody, they don't realize this, but if the U.S. is $20 below the world market, the, ex the imports just don't come into the U.S. They just go to other parts of the world. And so something has to happen. Either the imports have to come down in the world market or the U.S. has to come up. And recently, the, the U.S. was above the market, and we saw how imports continue to come in, and they, and they drove prices down to a point where now we're at an equilibrium of what the world market is. We're at a, we're at a balance. Um, there was a colleague that I knew was a major trader in the uh, uh, urea market and I know one day he called me up and he said, uh, Henry, I'm going to make urea go up $20 this week. And I said, well, I know you're a powerful man, but I just find that hard to believe. <laughs> and I said, what are you doing? He said, we have two 60,000 ton vessels and they're destined to come to the U.S. because we need that supply but the U.S. is $20 below the world market. So we're going to divert those to uh, South America because we can get $20 more and I'm going to go out and buy 120,000 tons on the U.S. market. I may not get it all bought at that price, but by Friday it'll be up 20. Well, by God, he went out and started buying everything he could find on the water and by Friday he moved that market up to, to equilibrium with the world. So that's how a lot of that stuff works anymore. Um, a lot of people think that the urea market, you know, like I say, we're, we're, we're kind of balanced. A lot of people think that the urea still could come up before spring. So, um, but again, there's a lot of things that can make that change. Um, on the UAN, UAN um, this year, again, we talk about how there's so much consolidation. Uh, we usually have fill programs in the summer and we can buy a large portion of our needs off season. And this year, the major suppliers, producers of UAN have chosen to say, we're only gonna sell 30 days of production. And they limited on how much you could buy. And a lot of people were not happy. And by doing that, they systematically were raising the price because the demand was still out there. And so UAN from this summer has come up quite a bit. Now recently they've, it has come off some. Um, they're starting to catch production's probably getting a little bit you know, better for them and their supply's a little bit stronger, so it has come off. But again, it's the major companies trying to balance the supply by being very selective on how much they sell and so forth. 
Now, with all that being said, you can make all the right plans and uh, you know for the future, but you have politics that come in play. You have you have uh, economics sometimes. Uh, Price of corn. Price. Mm -hmm. No and, you know, yeah, that's you know that could be politics, just like the bean thing mm -hmm. with China, and and you know the biggest biggest thing we have and we can't control is the weather, and weather can change a market dramatically. Um, I knew I, we have a customer that's been in the business decades and decades, and interestingly, we had a really wet spring one year, right after planting, and they had programmed a lot of nitrogen on the crops, so they were still short 40 pounds of nitrogen. And that spring, he spread urea over the top of maybe about a thousand tons of urea over the top because he had to get the nitrogen on. He said in his previous 50 years, he's only, he's only spread maybe 50 tons of urea. So there was an issue where weather came in and changed the whole dynamics of what his intentions were of what products he were gonna buy. So overall, I don't know if I, told you anything exciting, but that's a snapshot of what's going on in the industry right now. Well, it's, it's good to understand what's behind the curtain and what determines supply and the world market is really, really where that determines the U.S. prices, the that's world right. market. So it's not the local co-op that determines the prices. It's it's a much bigger uh, bigger picture. Uh, and, and then the fewer suppliers or fewer manufacturers of the product is... Uh, is making for less uh, volatility a little bit. Yeah, and you, you know we have a new nitrogen plant in our backyard, and these new nitrogen plants are are very economical basis on change in products. Meaning that if they have a better net back making UAN or DEF, they will ramp up production there and slow production down on maybe urea, and and by doing that they can change their dynamics significantly and, and, and where some of these older nitrogen plants can't do that. They can only run us, they can only slow down so much, but the newer plants can. And we see that happening a lot right now with these new plants to control supply uh, out there and try and, and keep uh, the, the pricing where they want. Okay, well thanks Henry. Well, Ben, uh, what did you pick up this week uh, on, on the agronomic side? Well, we had meetings last week in Iowa City, and just to piggyback a little bit, we were, Henry's talking about fertilizer. Um, we had uh, John Sawyer and uh, Dr. Malarino were, were two of the discussions that I went to and I sat in and listened to, and they're both talking about how to maximize yield by still watching out for um, crop inputs. And what they're basically saying, both of them are saying that the, that the industry as a whole, farmers as a whole, typically use um more nitrogen than what they than what they really need because they're not paying attention to the corn nitrogen rate calculator so that's one thing that i've been having discussions with with farmers throughout this week about really paying attention to what their input costs are um both on the nitrogen side and the pnk side and one of the things that dr malarino really that i found really interesting is that they're over a decade worth of studies they are having a very tough time to show the uh, the significance, unless it's unless it fits your program very very well, of strip tilling versus broadcast applying. So that's one place that you can save you know eight ten bucks an acre is maybe not running the uh, the strip till rig if that's something that you've done in the past you know for for a ten year period you know you can you can save that money by doing a uh, a broadcast application of your P and K and that's actually healthy for your soils because it's spreading out the you know you can do three or four years of strip till, and then it's probably pretty healthy for you to do a, a, a broadcast application of your PNK because it, it kind of evens everything out and that makes things easier for uh, so for, for, for uh, PNK sampling. So a farmer that's behind this year, didn't get his strip till fertilizer applied, uh, he could go ahead and broadcast and sleep at night that he's not making a mistake. Yes, especially if, if the soils are at optimum or high levels because at that point, you know, the, the the formulations that they use are are uh, optimum means that you can be running a maintenance rate. You don't necessarily need to be build, doing a building program if your soils are at optimum. That they really do mean optimum. You don't have to shoot for high on everything. So I thought that was very interesting what Dr. Malarino had to say. Oh, good Ben, it's good good information. 
Well, we're saving the, the best to last, and that's Turk. And uh, what's, what's the big news this week, Turk? Well, as everyone probably is aware by now, the uh, um, U.S. and China got together for some more trade talks. And uh, the very first night of those trade talks, uh, we were pleasantly surprised to hear uh, China announced that they have approved uh, E3, uh, Enlist E3 soybeans for import, which uh, it, we were hoping and, uh, and that that would happen, but it actually did happen this week. So your, your Christmas wish came true, Joe, and, uh, and you have uh, E3 soybeans now in the market. We still need Philippine approval uh, for these to be uh, fully approved for export uh, in the U.S., but uh, I just advise everybody to check with their grain buyers uh, and see if uh, they're going to be taking E3 soybeans, but it's going to be a it's going to be a lot of uh, E3 soybeans planted this spring, I'm sure. Turk, I've had farmers ask me and said, Philippines, you know, why why are they important to uh, to the U.S. soybean market? Tell me about that. They're actually the the number one um, our number one supplier or export market for um, soybean meal, and um, that's that's the really what it is and they don't buy soybeans that have any way to process them over there but they buy meal and um, so that it is a big market for uh, soybean meal. And as I understand it Turk, um, there will be no commercial launch of Enlist E3 until we get the Philippines approved. In other words, in other words that's a pledge that the uh, industry has made uh, that all future trades that must be fully approved before they'll, they'll go into the market. Now, that's not to say there's not going to be a lot of seed production. A company like Mershman Seeds obviously is going to be looking for seed production, which if we don't have the Philippine approval by planting time, it would be stewarded, which means... Correct. Stewarded means that you, the farmer has to plant those soybeans in a field, and then when he gets done planting that production field, he would have to empty any seed that's in his planter that's left over and leave it into the field. He could not move that seed out of that field. And that would have to be documented with uh, with paperwork mm -hmm. to designate that it's been done. So I, I know that we're gonna gonna have a lot of production of enlisting three anticipation of full approval, no issues at all for 2020. Correct. I've been in contact with the tried to be in contact with the uh, U.S. Embassy in the Philippines, but because of the government shutdown, they're they're not um, responding and in, in um, basically been instructed that it's emergency uh, contact only so Turk where are we at on for the approval of enlist E3 in the Philippines as, a, as we know it right now it's my understanding that we're on the top of the list right now to uh, be next up to have approvals for import in the Philippines but uh, again uh, everything is kind of on on hold now as far as us being able to find out any information over there doesn't mean that uh, that things in the Philippines aren't still moving forward but uh, we have no announcements yet. We're pretty confident, though, that we'll see an approval before fall and yes. uh, maybe even in this first quarter. But if you remember on the uh, Liberty Link GT27, it came on July 3rd, the Philippines. That was the last approval we needed. After, you know, so I think I'm pretty confident that we'll have it before fall, but maybe even this spring. Mm -hmm. It's hard to say. That's, we're, we're hopeful. Yep. Well, I appreciate that, and that, that's pretty exciting for Mershman Seeds because uh, Mershman Seeds will be one of the lead companies to bring this technology to farmers, and uh, we all know that uh, uh, a product that has glyphosate, glufosinate, and the new formulation of 2,4-D is, is a killer combination for, for palmer and water hemp and a whole list of other tough weeds that farmers are really fighting. And uh, our experience with uh, the chemistry part of it, the chemical part, has been awesome. I mean, and I can tell you, looking at the 2020 lineup that we're working on for Enlist E3, the genetics, because of a single gene insertion, are some of the best that I've ever seen. I, we are, we, I'm just, I just cannot wait to see uh, the looks on farmers' faces when they see the lineup of uh, Enlist E3 for for uh, 2020, and we're making huge improvements on our LibreLink GT27s also in terms of genetics. In fact, I can tell you that on the Enlist E3, we will have some quad stacks, products that are, are stacked with STS also. So that gives some farmers some real options uh, mm -hmm. in that area. The thing I'd like to close with is something that Elwin Taylor talked about um, 
uh, a week ago at our crop fair, and, and that was the weather in Argentina tends to mirror what we have in the United States. And it just hit me so hard when he said that because um, this past uh, fall, we were really wet. In, in fact, we had reports of beans sprouting in, uh, in the pods in some areas. Well, lo and behold, last spring, which would have been Argentina's fall, they had a wet fall, and we had a heck of a time getting our, our seed stock, our Enlist uh, uh, E3 seed stock that we were growing and our LibriLink GT27 winter production out of Argentina because they had a wet fall, and guess they had some soybeans that sprouted. So I went back and checked about this past fall, and which would be their spring, all our winter production was planted, and I said, you know, what kind of planting did we have? And it was perfect. You had a little bit of a, a wet spell and then perfect. So I just gave you the prediction for spring. We're going to have an early start. We're going to have a little, that's good for fertilizer, getting that fertilizer on, Henry. And then we're going to have a little bit of a, a break and then we're going to finish it up. So that should be a, a little bit reassuring uh, for the Midwest farmer that. Uh, this wet weather is not going to be too much of a trouble, too much trouble for us. So I, I look for an early spring and uh, maybe a little stutter step in the middle and then finish up. Anything else uh, to add to, uh, for this week's episode? As always, uh, Mershman Seeds uh, appreciates your business. Uh, it's always a, uh, we consider it a pleasure to, to work with uh, farmers or some of the best people in the world, and we thank you for listening today. Oh,